Good morning, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Um, we are in the final installment of our Feast Leadership Network webinars for 2015, and we are going to go out with a bang. Um, I'm Tracy Ganyu, the Community Resource Developer with the Oregon Food Bank, and I'm really excited because the topic we're going to discuss today is something that um, is very common and, and comes out of our FEAST events, our community organizing events. Um, FEAST, which stands for Food, Education, Agriculture Solutions Together, is something we've done in over 70 um, communities across the state, and Farm to School is something that rises out um, very regularly. Um, and we're excited to have the three leading experts on Farm to School on our call today. And I just actually found out that it's the first time that the three of them have been presenting um, together. So we're really lucky and I'm so glad that I can introduce them today. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to do a few housekeeping items. Please make sure that you're muted on your end. I'll try to make sure that you're also muted on my end, but um, it, it uh, makes the call a lot nicer when there's not sound interference. If you have a question, please type it into the, um, the chat box. I'll be monitoring that and we'll reserve those questions for the final Q&A section at the end. We'll also be sharing out links via the chat box and any links that I send out in the chat box, I will also include in a follow-up email. Also in a follow-up email, you'll be getting a survey. It's four questions, it's really quick, it'll take you a minute and that'll be really helpful for our process and making sure that these webinars are meeting your needs. And this webinar will be recorded, so if you have to duck out early or you want to share the content with someone perhaps in a school district you're working with um, or a principal or a teacher, community member, you can do that. It'll be available on our website um, probably in the next week, and I will also send a link to that as well. So just to quickly go over the agenda today, it's very full. Um, we're going to have a farm to school intro. We'll talk about local purchasing. We'll move into educational programs. We'll cover grants that are available and go over some food safety requirements. And then um, we'll reserve as much time as we can for Q&A at the end. And it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our three speakers today. I've had the pleasure of working with all of them. We'll begin with Megan Kempel. She serves as Oregon State Lead for the National Farm to School Network, providing technical assistance and training to farm to school programs throughout Oregon. She also serves as co-lead of the Oregon Farm to School and School Garden Network. Megan has nine years of experience directing a local farm to school program in Lane County and is now supporting programs statewide. Rick Sherman is also with us today. He's the Farm to School School Garden Coordinator for the Oregon Department of Education. He was hired by ODE in 2012 and has been working for, and before that was working for 32 years as a food service management um, director. The last 20 of those years have been spent as a director of nutrition services in Eugene, Albany, and Dallas, Oregon. So he has a lot of good, rich information. He graduated from Western Washington University with a degree in education. He has been a runner for almost 40 years, competing at the national level and has been a high school track and cross country coach for 20 years. He's a master gardener, loves home brewing and riding dirt bikes. He spends his spare time in his backyard garden and raises chickens. Amy Gilroy is the farm to school manager with the agriculture development and marketing division at ODA. Her role is to help Oregon producers, processors, distributors, and ranchers get their products into large food buying institutions such as schools, hospitals, and business campuses. She also works on regional food system development projects to address infrastructure needs in the supply chain. Amy holds a master's degree in public health from the University of Nebraska and has more than 10 years of experience in agriculture, public health, and community, community development and has provided consultation for Oregon jurisdictions on food system policy topics such as land use for urban agriculture, produce safety, and nutrition guidelines. So that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Megan. Um, she's going to do a really quick and dirty uh, Farm to School 101 for us. Um, Megan, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes. All right, you're on. Super. So first, let's start with the definition of Farm to School. This is a definition um, created by the National Farm to School Network. 
Farm to School is broadly defined as a program that connects schools, pre-K through 12, and local farms with the objectives of serving healthy meals in school cafeterias, improving student nutrition, providing agriculture health and nutrition education opportunities, and supporting local and regional farmers. Next slide. Farm to School programs differ by location. So, um, they are different in every part of the country, in every part of Oregon, depending on who is implementing programs, um, what capacity the community has, who's motivated in that community. Um, so they, they look very different depending on where we are, but they always include one or more of the following. So in order to be farm to school, they have to include one of these components procurement, which is when local foods are purchased, promoted, and served in the cafeteria or as a snack or taste test, educational activities where students participate in activities related to agriculture, food, health, or nutrition, and school gardens where students are engaging in hands-on learning through gardening. Next slide. Farm to school um, happens, we, sometimes we talk about, so here they are, here are those three main elements. Procurement, education, and school gardens. Next slide. Sometimes we talk about the five touch points of farm to school. So farm to school can happen in the cafeteria when local foods are served um, at lunchtime or in snack or breakfast programs, for example. And when those foods are highlighted in the cafeteria with posters, maybe, highlighting locally grown products or taste testing activities in the cafeteria to encourage kids to try new things or to test out local food recipes that are going to be offered. Um, farm to school can happen in the classroom, maybe with lessons on where food comes from and how it's grown or nutrition education focused on um, local foods that are available. It can happen in outdoor, outdoor learning spaces and school gardens. So it can happen on farm field trips, for example, or with garden-based education where kids are planting, tending crops, harvesting things, tasting things, um, getting science-based, hands-on science-based education in the garden, for example. School, uh, farm to school can even happen at home and with families. And we'll give some examples later of family, family education activities, but um, farm to school can happen at home when resources such as Oregon Harvest for Schools, um, which is a promotional program that's, um, that's offered through the Oregon Department of Education, Oregon Department of Ag, and, and other partners. Um, family newsletters are available. So family newsletters about Oregon foods like Oregon pears or Oregon apples could be sent home to families. Families can be engaged in family field trips or other family activities related to farm to school. And then farm to school can even extend into the community. And an example of that would be where a harvest of the month program, which is a, a program offering, offering one locally grown product each month and maybe highlighting that in the cafeteria at school is also highlighted at local grocery stores so that families are aware um, when they go to the grocery store that their child is trying the same thing at school. Um, community engagement can also happen when we just um, tell our stories through the media about farm to school. So those are the five touch points that we sometimes refer to or farm to school can happen so you can see it's really broad. Next slide. So actually, can you go back one, Tracy? Um, we'll just stick with this for a minute and give continue with a little introduction and um, talk about some resources before we dive into some of the details with getting started. So as I mentioned, Farm to School looks really different in different communities in Oregon, depending on who's there, uh, what the resources are, um, what the motivations of that community are, um, and, and also the, the culture of that community and the, and the agricultural capacity. So farm to school um, in some communities can um, be um, one, um, cook in the one cook in the kitchen who is motivated and interested. Maybe they have a connection with a local farm and they stop at the farm on the way um, in to school and get apples um, that they offer um, once or twice a year. 
when they're available. It could be a partnership with Oregon State University Extension where um, nutrition educators are educating kids about local food options and helping kids taste, um, do testings of, of recipes in the cafeteria. It could be a program, uh, uh, a large-scale school garden program or farm-to-school program with farm field trips and educational activities that are implemented by a nonprofit partner. It could be um, a program that's broadly, that's been really integrated into the nutrition services program by a um, nutrition services director. So farm to school looks really different depending on where we are and who's involved. And um, we are really lucky in Oregon to have farm to school programs all over the state of Oregon and school gardens all over the state of Oregon. So we have mapped, Rick has mapped, Rick with Oregon Department of Education has mapped all of the school gardens in Oregon and we have over 600 school gardens I believe in Oregon and he can clarify that. But we have farm to school programs throughout the state and we're also really fortunate to have um, resource people that can help you at the statewide level. So my role um, is that I'm the Oregon State Lead for the National Farm to School Network so I can provide technical assistance and support um, to farm to school programs throughout Oregon. So I can provide you with um, guidance and help with your program if you, if you would like that support. We are also really blessed to have um, two positions, Rick and Amy's positions within the Oregon Department of Education and the Oregon Department of Agriculture and we're one of the only states in the country to have positions within both of those departments. We are also really blessed to have a, a significant amount of funding from the Oregon State Legislature and this past legislative session secured four point five million dollars from the Oregon State Legislature to support farm to school programs in Oregon. Um, we have a network of farm to school stakeholders called the Oregon Farm to School and School Garden Network, which is a network of over 500 farm to school stakeholders in Oregon, including nutrition services folks, garden educators, nonprofit partners, and we share information via an email list. Um, you can contact me if you would like to be added to that email list and actually maybe I'll make a note that we might send out that subscription information after the webinar so that you can get engaged and receive those resources via the email list if you haven't already, if you're not already on the list. And then we have an annual gathering um, every year in January or February. We think the date will be very early February in Oregon. Um, somewhere in the Willamette, in the central Willamette Valley, we'll have our Oregon Farm to School Summit and our Oregon School Garden Summits back to back, two days of a big Farm to School conference. And we're we're looking right now at February 4th and 5th in Silverton, but that's not totally finalized yet. So we have a lot of resources. We have a lot of resource people. We also have a bunch of other resource people that I haven't even mentioned who are resource people that can provide support with farm to preschool, um, who can provide support with policy, with program evaluation, and there will be a handout available to you um, with all of their contact information after the webinar. Thanks, sent out by email. Next slide. So let's dive into getting started. So um, how to define, what, it, what is local food? How to define local? So you get to decide how you define local for your community or your school district. So first think about your capacity to buy local and how you want to define it. If you are, local can mean food from your um, grown or processed in your immediate community or county. So your immediate community, it can mean Oregon or it can be the region. We're going to be talking about um, some grants that are available through the Oregon Department of Education, Oregon's Farm to School Grants, and those grants are available only for purchases of 
Oregon foods. So there are certain certain um, programs where we specify Oregon foods. But in general, for your your farm to school program, you can define local as you'd like. Um, some communities um, really want to focus or prioritize um, very local products grown right in their county. And others who are on the border, for example, in far eastern Oregon or uh, in northern Oregon, you may decide that it makes more sense to be regional and get products from across the border. So we won't decide that for you except in the case where you want to be reimbursed from this particular grant that's limited to Oregon products. Next slide. So which products? Which products to start with? This is a kind of a getting started, an introduction to farm to school. Um, and there may be some tips in here for those of you who are a little further along, but this is really kind of the basics. So local milk is a really easy place to start, is an easy place to start. Most school districts in Oregon are probably um, getting milk that was um, from an Oregon dairy already. Some that are um, in northern, it, you know, on the on the border of the state, maybe getting their milk from other states, and even some in the center of the state, maybe getting it from a distributor that brings it from out of state. But generally, um, milk is um, milk is pretty local because it's highly perishable and it's coming from dairies that are pretty close by. Another easy the the kind of the next level people often school districts often start with um, locally grown fruits and vegetables, and um, they're they're an easier place to start because the they tend to be um, less expensive than some other products that you'll see here, and we'll talk about those a little bit. So fruits and veggies can be a good a good place to start. Processed products are also a great opportunity. So that could mean using bagels that are um, that are made right in your community at a local baker bake, uh, bake, uh, bagel bakery, for example, or um, even in the case that there are, there are a lot of school districts now, actually we'll talk about that in a minute, but could even consider using locally, locally grown grains in, that, in those bagels. Some school districts are making hummus, for example, uh, are, are offering locally processed hummus that's processed by a local, um, a local food processor or yogurt that comes from a local dairy, made at a local dairy. So those are some examples, bagels, yogurt, hummus, that type of thing. Um, flour and whole grains are another great option. So um, there are school districts that are purchasing um, whole grains directly from farms, for example, barley and including that in soups or flour that is milled in Oregon and even um, flour that comes from wheat grown in Oregon. So there's a farm in Junction City called Camas Country Mill. Sorry, it's called actually called Hunton's Farm, and Hunton's Farm um, is connected with um, Camas Country Mill, where the wheat grown at Hunton's Farm is milled right there in Junction City. So the wheat's grown in Junction City at Hunton's Farm. The um, flour is milled right there in Junction City, and five school districts in Oregon are buying locally Oregon um, grown and processed whole grain flour that is incorporated into school meals and that works best if schools have scratch kitchens or bakeries for example. Beans are another example so um, Oregon grown beans or Oregon processed beans, meat, um, a, a lot of school districts are buying Oregon beef and Painted Hills is one um, uh, beef provider that is selling to a lot of schools. And seafood is also an option, of course. So there are, um, there have been, there are examples of school districts, um, even as far in the middle of the state as um, Bend Lapine School District in Central Oregon that are doing boat to school. So are buying, are buying seafood from the coast. Um, they are also, they're a really great example of what, of using local meat. They have incorporated, they have kids um, in the Future Farmers of America program raising pigs. Um, the pigs are sent to a USDA um, certified slaughterhouse and the, the pork comes back to the school, the culinary, high school culinary classes are learning how to process the pork and do the cuts and 
they are serving the pork, they have a smoker, and they're serving the pork in, in school lunches. So that's a pretty um, high level example of meat, meat incorporated, local meat in school meals. Next slide. So which fruits and veggies? So I sometimes recommend that people think about starting with things that can be used in their whole form or pretty much look the same as they would if they came through a produce distributor. So one challenge with farm to school is that often a product will look different or come in a different form than we're used to if we buy it locally. For example, we might be used to getting um, um, carrots, um, jumbo carrots, clip top jumbo carrots, and all the carrots are the same size, they're topped the same, they're in the same form and they work really well for the kitchen staff because they can send them through their coiners and when they get local carrots they might be different size or shape and it's certainly um, and, and it might be challenging, could be challenging for the school district to, to uh, or for the kitchen staff to handle products that look really different. It's certainly not impossible but it's one of the challenges that we face with Farm to School. So some things that come in basically the same form that they would, whether they're local or not, are small apples. Um, small apples can be really great for kids' mouths, obviously. So um, apples, whole strawberries, frozen fruit that could be used, for example, on a yogurt parfait or something. Sweet peas, potatoes look basically look the same as they would if they came from a distributor generally. Pears, for example. Next slide. Some products that are can be easily processed that do need a little processing but aren't terribly time consuming to um, process are tomatoes that would need to be sliced, cucumbers that would need to be sliced, broccoli or cauliflower. Um, those are some easy starting, starting points. That is my phone. I apologize. Next slide. Products that are totally possible but can be more difficult are corn on the cob, for example. Um, corn on the cob is um, fun and delicious, but um, if it comes in a husk, someone has to husk it, and that could be kids. Winter squash can be more difficult to deal with for kitchen staff because it has to be cut with a very sharp knife, um, so kitchen staff have to have knife that's um, adequate to cut a squash. It has to be, they have to have space to cut the squash in the kitchen. Um, they would need to bake it, seed it, like they could dice it, I suppose. So there's there's all kinds of ways it could be served, but once it was cooked, we'd have to figure out what to do it do with it. And the, the kitchen would need to have a scratch cooking facility. And many schools have the capacity to deal with winter squash, and a lot of schools have used it. It's great in soups. Um, it can be great in muffins. Um, but it's a little more challenging, obviously, than an apple, for example. Carrots can be challenging um, because they're different sizes. When they come from a local farm, often they may need peeling, and um, lots of schools have used local carrots as well. So it's just kind of the, the higher level. It takes a little more resource. Next slide. So we can think about how to plan for plan for the season and think about what we might want to use. Sometimes I recommend um, that people start small, that school districts start, start small, so that the process feels feasible for everyone and that kitchen staff feel like the, they have the capacity to do what they're being asked and they're not immediately overwhelmed and um, um, feel more interested in in continuing and expanding as they're able and have the capacity because it's been a really positive experience. So we might want to start, you might want to start small with maybe one product each month. Sometimes we call that, we call that a harvest of the month program where one product is, one Oregon grown product is um, served each month and highlighted on the school menu and um, with posters, for example. Or you might say, hmm, I don't know if we're going to be able to find something during the during the winter months. So we may only want to um, we may want to start 
um, with a program where we're only um, highlighting local foods and really focusing on local purchasing during the high harvest season in the fall and into the into the late fall. If we're going to do um, a monthly type program, it's a good idea to make a calendar. And I recommend that people start planning early in the year in February or March um, because if we go to our local farmers in um, October and say, I'd like to buy um, 400 pounds of your carrots, um, they are likely, they may say, hmm, I would have loved to sold you carrots, but have sold you carrots, but um, if you'd just told me and in March or April when I was um, buying seed and planting, I would have had, I would have had plenty, but they're all spoken for. So it's a good idea to start planning and having that communication with farmers, keeping in mind that they are doing their planning and planting in February and March. Next slide. This is an example of a harvest of the month calendar where one one Oregon product is served each month and these are just some options so each each month has a few different choices but um, we need to keep in mind um, that farm to school means that we're getting food from farms from local farms which means we have to think about when those products are grown and harvested so we won't be able to serve fresh Oregon tomatoes in January because there are not really fresh Oregon tomatoes in January, except in some um, hydroponic and um, really, um, there, are, there are a few options, but it's pretty uncommon that we can get fresh Oregon tomatoes in, in January. So um, we think about what is available during that time of year. So in September, for example, we might use tomatoes or melons because they're not going to be available long after that. So we want to take advantage of it. In October, melons might still be available, it might be our last chance to get them. Grapes might be available, pears or Asian pears. In November, um, we might be able to use carrots still. Carrots store for a while. Apples can store as late as February or March if they're stored in the proper conditions and that would probably mean having a distributor or the farmer store them. Um, so apples can keep until maybe December and January. Kiwis are available in Oregon in February. Pears are still available, actually, so maybe I shouldn't have put pears in October because we can use them later. Pears can be a little tricky because it's really hard to get a pear, as you probably know, even going to the grocery store, um, at, its, at its perfect ripeness. And so pears can be a little tricky for schools because the um, kitchen staff really need to keep them stored and, and, and use them right when they're ripe and not let them go any longer than that, which can be a challenge. But bears are delicious and they're a great way to let kids know about Oregon agriculture. Um, cabbage um, can store and um, keep as long as January or February. Potatoes can keep until March. Um, in March, we might have, we might things might be getting a little slim because some of those crops that can be stored are um, no longer no longer in storage. They, they, they don't keep that long. Um, there are Oregon grown mushrooms available year round. Um, by April or May, so Oregon grown mushrooms um, grow in the Yamhill Valley in dark, um, dark damp um, warehouses um, that you may see if you're going past um, the Salem area and they're they're available year-round in Oregon. Um, in April or May things might be getting a little bit slim and in terms of those fresh or stored products and so it might be good to have some frozen berries available so frozen strawberries or frozen blueberries and then in June we might be able to um, get started again with some fresh things maybe some fresh radishes salad greens or even fresh strawberries during the last couple weeks of school. So I should have mentioned, um, in case any of you are writing this down, that this slide is one of the handouts that I provided to Tracy. So um, you will receive a copy of this sample harvest of the month calendar. Um, and then just keep in mind, I like to keep in mind that we need to be flexible with farm to school. So if we have a plan for something and it doesn't work out because it's not available, that we have a backup. 
having a backup plan is great, which is why there are a couple different options for some of these, or we can switch some of them around. Um, but also, we might be in a situation where we come to February or we come to March, for example, and there's just not an the product we planned on isn't available and we need to we need to skip harvest of the month for one month and that is okay too. Okay, next slide. So how to connect with farmers. Think about um, think about farms in your community. Um, you might think about your um, you might think about who's in your school district, kids in your district that might be from farm families or farms that you know or maybe you have ideally a farm to school. We didn't really talk about this but it can be really helpful to develop a little farm to school committee. You've got folks advising you and thinking about community connections and farm to school opportunities and if you've got a little team think about who those people might be connected to. You can visit the farmers market, um, talk with farmers and see if any of them are interested in selling to district to your school. Um, you can ask your distributor to help. So local produce distributors are often buying from Oregon farms or even farms um, closer, closer to home for you. And if you ask your distributor to identify, to, to tell you which products they sell, which come from, uh, which are local, they should be able to do that for you. And then you should be able to request those products um, when it's time to place your order. So for example, instead of saying, oh, um, we'd like our um, 10 cases of apples, you might say, I'd like, we, this month we want the 10 cases of Oregon apples, or we want the 10 cases of apples from Deering Orchards. And that would be, what, that would be your order. Um, you might have someone in your community, a nonprofit partner, who can help you make those connections. Sometimes we call that a benevolent broker, someone who can help make the connections um, and help with the sales but isn't profiting from the sales. Um, and then there's a resource called Oregon Harvest for Schools Food Hub Portal. And next slide. That's an online resource. We actually don't have a handout for that. I don't have a handout for that, but you can Google Oregon Harvest for Schools portal or Oregon Harvest for Schools Food Hub. And the website it will be on the, oh, it's at the top actually. It's a little bit hard to see. Food-hub.org slash OHS4S. But you can find it easily just Googling Oregon Harvest for Schools and it's on the Oregon Department of Education's website as well, Farm to School website, which Rick will share. So if we were going to use this tool, we would, this is the first page we come to. It's got, uh, we can click on blueberries, for example. Next slide. We'll get, we found 19 Oregon Harvest for School suppliers selling blueberries. These are all farms that have been vetted and, and we've determined that they are ready to sell to schools. They have quantity and they're they're interested in selling to schools and have capacity to do so. But I might say, oh, that's a lot. 19, um, Food Hub knows where I am because I've logged in with my location when I made an account. So it's sort of these by closest to furthest away from me. And um, But I, I might feel like this is too many choices. So next slide. So I can indicate, you can see on the right hand side, that I only want frozen blueberries. And now let's see what we get. So we got six. We found six Oregon Harvest for Schools suppliers selling blueberries. Next slide. I can click on one of them and I can get information, more information about that farmer with their contact info. I can reach out to them. Um, and next slide. I can reach out to them by email or phone, or I can use Food Hub to send a message, but it's totally fine to just pick up the phone and call them as well. And I can also learn more about the other products they sell, and I might be able to um, kind of bundle my purchases and buy from them by more than one product, which can make things a little simpler. Next slide. Okay. When we, um, let's see, we. I talked a little bit about forward contracting, so there's a handout I think that you'll receive after the webinar 
with this language, and this is just an example of how you might plan ahead and make an arrangement with a local farm. So it's intention of the school district to purchase products from this farm. It's the intention of this farm to grow and sell the products. Details about the products, the prices, and then a note, this is not a legally binding document. It serves to document our intentions and agreements. So this can really help as we're planning ahead with a farmer to make sure that they know we, want, we intend to buy their product and um, they plan to sell it to us as a school district. Um, next slide. And then you want to promote your local purchases. You want to let kids and families know what you're serving. So um, Oregon Harvest for Schools is a great resource. Um, it's a Oregon Department of Education has a great website with posters for um, pears, apples, asparagus, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all kinds of Oregon products with family newsletters, signage for the cafeteria, um, a, a lot of great resources that you can use to promote your products in the school and to families. And that is all available on the Oregon Department of Education's Farm to School website, which Rick will share. But when I want to find it, I just Google Oregon Department of Education Farm to School and I, the website comes up and those resources will be there. Next slide. So let's talk about educational programming. So um, educational programming can include, Tracy, I think it would work best for this if you just kind of um, click slowly through there. Well, we'll see how this goes. Lots of slides and I'll just t say a, a few words about each of them. So. Um, exploring at the farm. Next slide. When we visit local farms for farm field trips, kids always taste things in the field. Next slide. So this child has a little raspberry juice on his face. We always do a helping task, so kids help the farmer with something that's needed. Kids harvest from the farm. They, they harvest fresh ingredients and take them back to school to make a snack or meal with food they harvested themselves. So they're gathering food into their harvest baskets, bringing them back to the classroom and making a snack or meal, for example, fresh salsa with fresh tomatoes, corn, peppers, cilantro, onions, garlic. So they really make that connection from um, about where, where our food comes from and how it's grown. Next slide. So that was just a little taste of farm field trips. Another um, great educational activity is uh, tasting tables. So we can um, set up a little table in the cafeteria and offer taste tests of products that are being highlighted for harvest of the month, for example, or maybe a new recipe that the school kitchen staff are trying out um, and they're not sure whether the kids are going to like it or not, so we can do a little taste testing. Um, and we can also just, um, the taste testing can really help to, to get the kids to try new things um, that, the, that the, the kitchen staff might be offering. So tastings are a really great um, and important part of some farm to school programs. Next slide. And of course, school gardens. So. Um, we can engage with kids in the school garden right at our school um, and, giving, and give kids the opportunity to plant in the garden, tend, tend the garden, harvest things, taste things that they've grown themselves. And we know that when kids plant and tend something, they are more likely to eat it. They get excited about it in the cafeteria. When they see it in the cafeteria, um, we can consider offering those products on the salad bar, for example, or even incorporated into school meals. And Rick will talk about that a little bit. And um, kids can also be engaged in hands-on science-based learning in the garden. So another piece of another another piece of farm to school can be um, family engagement. So we can do some of these same type of activities with families. And at Willamette Farm and Food Coalition, we um, take families on family field trips to a local farm. Next slide. Families get to visit the farm stand and. Um, we provide them coupons that they can use to shop at the local farm stand. Next slide. 
we visit the farmers market with families. Um, they tour the farmers market, they sample products at the market, they get to shop with coupons that we provide them and they come back excited about what they've, what they've purchased and we give them another coupon so that they'll return in the future and hope that they come back to the market. Next slide. We provide Oregon Department of Education, uh, the Oregon Harvest for Schools family newsletters. Those are, here's an example of what those look like to all of the families that participate in our program. And I think that might be it. That's it. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Thank so you. Now, and Megan will be joining us for the Q&A section. So if you have any burning questions for her, she'll be able to hopefully address some of them during the Q&A at the end. Um, but now we've got Rick Sherman up. And Rick, if you could unmute yourself, you are up. I cannot unmute you from this end, it looks like. So if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. Nope, oh, there you go. Perfect. Are you there? We cannot hear you if you're speaking. Sorry, folks, for this little delay here. I can tell that Rick is troubleshooting on the other end. So we'll give Rick another maybe 30 seconds here, and if we can't hear from him, we can skip ahead to Amy's presentation and then go back if we need to. Also, now is not a bad time. If you have questions for Megan, you can feel free to uh, type those into the chat box and um, we could potentially do some quick Q&A right now. Megan, if you have anything you want to elaborate on, feel free to add it. I don't see any questions coming in quite yet. Um, okay. And I'm hoping Rick will join us soon. But Amy, if you want to get yourself ready, we might be priming you. <laughs> So Megan, one question I have for you is how many how many programs do both a farm to school program where they're serving local foods in the cafeteria and um, they're doing an education program? Is that pretty is that pretty normal to have both of those happening or do some schools do one or the other? There isn't I don't have any any numbers for you, but um, it, it's most common in my experience that schools do one or the other. So but Almost everybody does some kind of promotion of their local purchases, which could be the tasting tables or posters, and that is a form of education. Um, but the um, farm field trips, for example, are something that um, a lot of schools are providing farm field trips, but having them be really intentional in terms of being educational to educate kids about where food comes from and how it's grown is is pretty is is not as um, not not the norm. So farm Farm field trips are a little bit unusual, but lots of schools have school gardens. So school gardens are very common in Oregon, and that's one of the educational programs that are, are very popular. I've got, I see a question. Oh, good. Rick's with us. We got it. Sorry, guys. I oh. hung up and tried in again, so here I am. Oh, great. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Megan. Uh, sorry. Best best laid uh, uh, plans of mice and man. Uh, we did this before, but anyway, so I'll just um, start going in. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Tracy. 
There we go. So um, as Megan said, um, our website, that is the long address to the website. Everything can be on here, uh, found on there. But I would recommend, just like she said, if you just Google Oregon School Gardens or Oregon Farm to School, it'll be the number one choice. And you'll be able to go there. Um, I'm going to speak about the grants. And um, that, if you click on our website, there is a grants and funding opportunity section. Um, go ahead, next slide. And so yeah, that is our splash page of our main uh, main page. And so everything on there that Megan was talking about, the Oregon Harvest for Schools is is the fourth bullet down. The Oregon School Garden Map, which we have, you're correct, 611 school gardens. That's on there. You can find your community school gardens on the right-hand side. But the big giant yellow arrow, arrow is showing the grants and funding opportunities. If you click on that, it will look like the next slide. That is our grants page, and basically it's um, it's in two different categories. So yeah, four point five million dollars, but basically eighty percent of that four point five million dollars is happening right now. It's the left side of the screen. It's for the non-competitive Oregon grown or Oregon processed food available to all Oregon school districts um, for reimbursement of Oregon grown or Oregon processed food. And then the other part of it is 20% of the $4.5 million, which is a competitive grant that will be available soon. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's the right-hand side of the screen. So I typically don't send out um, materials to people. I just keep telling them to come to here to download everything. So this is the one-stop shop for everything grant-related for this grant. Next slide. So this came about as uh, the uh, Senate Bill 501 directed Oregon Department of Ed to award grants to Oregon school districts for reimbursement of costs of incurring purchasing Oregon food products that meet certain base criteria, which is Oregon grown or Oregon processed, and for funding food-based, ag-based, and garden-based educational activities. So those are the, this used to be one grant the last two sessions, the last two uh, biennia, um, and now we've split it into the two I was talking about. Next slide. So here's here's how we got here. Um, our first, uh, when I first got hired back in 2012, um, I barely even knew what a grant was, but um, we had a little pilot project and we were awarded $200,000, and I believe we had nine school districts for the for that grant, and it was split. You know, it was a competitive grant at the time for 80% for food purchasing and 20% for education. Um, so we did that. We were successful in spending all the money, got some good best practices. And then the last biennium that just finished, we were awarded $1.2 million. And the neat thing about that is, is there wasn't a sunset clause written into it. So Basically, that means it's a perpetual grant that will um, should continue to be rolled over every year. And uh, from what I understand, the only way uh, that would go away is if there was a round of budget cuts. Uh, so it's in the governor's budget. So, um, and again, uh, yeah, that explains uh, how it was split. So the uh, next slide, please. And so for this biennium, which we just started um, in July, um, $3.3 million um, more additional was added to it, um, to bringing it up to, that's how we got to the $4.5 million. However, the $3.3 million does, does have a sunset clause. So this is a one-time cash influx. So after that um, is gone, um, we are anticipating um, to go back to the $1.2 million level unless we get more money. Um, again, we'd have to go back um, uh, to the legislature asking for more. So now, so yes, like I said in the, in the one slide uh, on our website, um, you can see there it's, it's split into two sections, uh, non-competitive grant, and again, that's going on right now and then a competitive grant for food, garden, or ag-based educational opportunities. The thought is, like Megan shared, these are supposed to work in concert with one another. So if you just buy local food and put it out, kids may or may not choose to eat it. But if you teach them about it, 
they tend to devour the food. If you say, okay, here's local food from either your school garden or, or whatever, but if you teach them about it, saying this is food from your garden or a farmer field trip or whatever, and you, you announce it on uh, through materials and, and refer to it, the kids really get that message, and that's the beauty of this program. Next slide. So in, in terms of uh, to be reimbursed for this, districts need to work with vendors to be able to identify products, and that has happened very well. If, if um, they work directly with a farm, that works super well. Um, in, in terms of getting reimbursed. But um, vendors now, in terms of distributors, are getting the message and they're working with us uh, identifying Oregon product. Um, it's happening more and more all the time. We're really pleased about that. So they, uh, the food service folks keep invoices on hand to justify this. Next slide. So getting to the competitive educational grant, as I've said, um, it's available um, for for the garden-based, food-based, and uh, ag-based educational opportunities. It, the grant will be available for school, to school districts, nonprofit organizations, and commodity commissions or councils. And I get the question of what that is, and that's like, uh, like Oregon Dairy Council, Oregon Beef Council, Trawl Commission, things like that is a commodity commission. Next slide. So the grant is available um, to provide those items, which I have talked about um, quite a bit. So food-based, ag-based, garden-based, educational opportunities. Next slide. Some of the reimbursable items for this is for staff time, travel costs, equipment purchased for those garden-based activities. Next slide. Preference are given to the activities. The selection committee are looking for these things. Um, items that are well designed, that promote healthy food activities, have a clear educational objective, involve parents in the community. Next slide. Are connected to a school district's farm to school procurement activities and are culturally relevant to the students being served by the grant monies. And, and what we mean by cultural relevance is we don't want to make an assumption over what we think um, uh, farm to school is, like a um, like an American turkey dinner um, it, that's supposed to fit into some certain category. If there's a cultural relevance of what meals are in there, we want to explore that and embrace it. Next slide. Also, we uh, we want to select school districts of, uh, with a variety of school sizes and geographic locations. We want metro schools, uh, tiny schools, uh, remote schools, schools in eastern Oregon, schools on the coast. Um, the key is for folks to apply, so we have them on our radar. We can't um, we we can't award uh, this to a school district if we don't have an application. So um, there there is a plan um, of us and um, our myself as well as our our community partners to advertise this when it becomes available. The competitive part, um, but we really want to um, try to make this widespread. The 20% of $4.5 million, it's going to work out to just under $900,000, so we'll be able to spread that out a lot. Um, we also want to serve a high percentage of children who qualify for free and reduced prices under the National School Lunch Program, and that could um, um, that's up to the school how they want to apply. If a school district in, has a total free and reduced population that is kind of low, but they have a couple schools that are are higher, they might choose to just say, well, we want to choose to uh, have this school um, as part of our district apply. Um, we'll apply as a district, but we are going to channel the dollars to the, the higher percentage school. So, so that's one way people have made that work in the past. Next slide. So um, the reason why this part isn't going on concurrently so far with the uh, procurement side, the, the, the non-competitive grant. Um, since uh, there was so much money available to uh, for a competitive grant process, we had to go through a rules process with the State Board of Education. Um, we're in the middle of that right now. Um, 
the process will be finalized uh, at a December 10th State Board of Education meeting. After that, we anticipate um, we should be ready to roll out the RFA. Uh, the RFA should be um, released right after the December 10th meeting, probably closer to um, winter break. And then um, it'll remain open until mid-February. That's at least what um, we're thinking right now. So it'll be um, closing, closing mid-February, and it will be available through the rest of the biennial, which is the end of this school year and all of next school year to help to you'd have available to spend the funds so the end of 2017 school year it would be available to spend next slide so the the important way people ask how will I know about this when you know on updates um, the website will be updated that I shared with you about the grant anytime there's anything new on there that'll be updated also on the front page of our website there's a listserv there if you click on the join us link you will be signed up signed up for a listserv and anytime there's anything going on with the grant you will be notified that way so those are our two methods we have to talk to people about that next slide um that that was everything about the the uh, grant opportunity I had right now I was asked also to transition into just a couple slides on garden food safety as, as we, we start talking about garden and farm safety. I think Amy will take it over after me, but um, as far as garden food safety, I get a lot of questions on is it legal, is it safe, can we serve um, produce from our gardens? And it's all about minimizing risks. You can't eliminate risks in any way, but um, you can minimize them if you have a solid system in place for or um, minimizing them. So knowing what you're doing, um, this kind of comes from my background as a food service director for years. Um, so uh, uh, next slide. Uh, the law, what is the law in Oregon? Next slide. Um, there's no regulations for produce um, as opposed to poultry, meat, eggs, shellfish. Those things need to be um, USDA inspected typically and, and there's, um, they're highly regulated produce, although it's getting more like that all the time. Um, the Oregon law just stipulates that produce must come from a reputable source. And so that's open to interpretation. Um, it's up to you to define, um, you know, how reputable something is. And we always say, know your farmer, know your food. If you, if if you're buying direct from a farm, you should check out the farm and see how how things are. Um, if you if you're buying things, and same thing with your school garden. And like I say here, um, a county health inspector inspector typically doesn't care whether the food comes from the Cisco truck or a garden, but they demand that it needs to be handled properly. Next slide. And that's, and that's, I think uh, I said that again here. I didn't mean to hammer it home twice, um, but it's in, in two slides, but there's no um, regulations for produce as, oppo as opposed to meat in inspections. Um, I, always, I always say it too, a lot of school gardens, they have a requirement um, at the school level, they want to have it fenced in. Um, and that's um, for a little bit of peace of mind, they like to, um, cut down on vandalism or critters getting into your garden. Um, usually the produce that comes from a farm, you know, it's not fenced in, it's just food for thought. And if people or folks want to get in bad enough to vandalize or critters, they're going to find a way in. Um, deer can typically jump up to nine feet even to, to jump over a garden. So you do as best you can, but a little bit of common sense there. I just like to put that in as a a uh, little common sense um, guide. Next slide. Um, so one thing that we did though, um, when I first got on the job, I got a lot of questions from school principals and stuff that were concerned about liability. So we, divined, we uh, devised this plan. It took a year to write. Um, it's the Oregon School Garden Food Safety Training and Documentation Manual. I worked for it. I worked with it um, with folks from all over the country, about 50 folks. Um, if, and again, if you Google Oregon School Garden Food Safety, you'll go right to the page. You could download this for free on our website. Um, click on the next slide here, and I believe it'll have 
um, yeah, well, there's a screenshot of, of you know, if you Google that, you'll go right to this page. Or if you just go to our main page, it's um, Oregon um, uh, Food Safety on, and the School Garden page. And you, you can um, download um, each individual section or the highlighted one is a link to the, the entire manual. And you can, it's a PDF form, and you could um, use it. And the next slide has... Um, these are, I'm not going to go over these in detail, but basically it has a lot of checklists and logs where you can teach your garden leaders, your staff, your classrooms that come through. Um, and the, this manual, when I've showed it to county health inspectors, they have been very, very um, ecstatic about it. They, they like it. Um, there are a lot of things out there in the country that in terms of here's what you should do, but this is the only one that I'm aware of so far that, that basically has a step-by-step -step training and documentation manual where it shows like if it's not documented, it didn't happen kind of thing. So it has startup and weekly checklists and you could um, ensure that you're doing things as safe as you can if you're following the protocol. Um, uh, if you're following the protocol. And so it's not something that's designed to be held, just thrown on a, a, a shelf and referred to, but if you use it um, all the time, you're going to be doing uh, uh, as, as good as you can in terms of minimizing risks. Next slide. And um, that is the end. That's my little disclaimer page, and I'm done now. And I think we're off to the next person, which is probably Amy. Yeah, thanks, Rick. That's That was great. And um, Rick will be back for Q&A, which will probably be pretty short, but I've got a list of the questions that folks have been sending in already. Um, Amy, you're up. I'm hoping the sound works for you. I've unmuted you on my end, so let's see if the audio works. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. That's great. All right, take it away. So hi everyone, uh, this is Amy at the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about what our department is doing to support Farm to School in Oregon uh, and how we can be a resource for producers that are interested in selling to schools. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go through these slides quickly because I imagine there's a lot of um, questions people have and you know, there's a lot that myself and Rick and Megan can provide to you in more detail so I want to make sure we we get to that. So I'm just going to take a few minutes uh, to share some information about a pilot project um, that, that Oregon producers and schools are part of. Uh, and then I'm going to go over some of the legal and food safety requirements for selling uh, to schools. Uh, and then I also wanted to make an announcement about a, um, a campaign, a farm to school promotion campaign that our division is um, getting ready to start in Oregon. And, and also, um, we'll be expanding our Food Corps Oregon uh, program, and so I want to make a couple announcements about that, too, and make sure that you know, people know how to tap into um, those resources. Next slide. So, so before I jump in, uh, I, wanted to, I just wanted to give a quick picture of how our Farm to School orange dots and, and what we've done is we've mapped and I know I know Rick has a school garden map like this too but what we've done over the last couple of years is 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 try to document the farm to school producers around the state who are who are selling to schools and so this is a map of about 200 uh, producers ranchers processors even distributors um, and where they're located across Oregon um, that we know have had a sale to a school or currently sell sell to schools I imagine many of you are interested in finding out who these these groups are, and as Megan said, um, you know the Oregon Harvest uh, Portal is a great resource for you. But if but if there are some in your area that um, you'd like to know more specifically who they are, what products they offer, um, I would suggest that you know you contact you can contact our department. And we can put you in touch with them again, depending on uh, what you're looking for. So I just wanted to to highlight that map quickly. Next slide. So another resource um, that I wanted to share with you because we are we're really trying to get the word out about the pilot project um, with the USDA um, and help producers and schools tap into it 
um, is a USDA, it's called the USDA Pilot Project for the Procurement of Unprocessed Fruits and Vegetables, quite a lengthy title. We simply call it the UFV Pilot. Um, and what's the most, the most important thing I want to, um, I want to emphasize about this, this pilot is that it's completely separate than the Oregon Farm to School and School Garden Grants that, um, that Rick just discussed. Um, however, we do have, we are one of eight states that's participating, and the, and the purpose of it is to get more unprocessed fruits and vegetables, um, and so that means, you know, something that's minimally processed, so it can be peeled, chopped, cut, uh, can also be dried product, um, as well as frozen, and get that into um, the school meals program. We have about 22 schools that are currently enrolled in the pilot. Uh, in Oregon, and they've set aside some of their their USDA foods entitlement funding. We I think this last year in total is about four hundred thousand dollars to purchase from a, a selection of vendors, and these vendors do have to be approved um, by the USDA to participate. And we have a handful of them right now that are um, you know that are that are, that are participating. Um, and so I just wanted to mention it, and and I, there's a lot more detail behind it, and if people are interested in it, um, I, I'm happy to. To give out more information, we do have um, one of Rick's counterparts at the Department of Education, Chris Fascia, and I are both sort of responsible for working with the producer community and schools to help them connect. Uh, and then one of the things that we are providing in addition is a, a cost share program for food safety for growers that are interested in the program. And so if people have questions about that and how it works and, and how they can tap into that funding stream, I'm happy to. Um, answer questions or be a resource for people um, about that as well. Next slide. So um, Rick sort of touched on food safety and liability, but I, I did want to bring a, a few things up because they're really in, they're really quite important, especially especially right now. Um, and I and I wanted to reiterate what he said. There is there are no state or federal food safety laws that are that schools have to follow right now. Um, you know, what, like Rick said, sometimes districts will set their own requirements about um, about food procurement in terms of any food safety certification or labeling that that has to um, accompany their purchasing. But it's really it's really a district by district decision. Um, schools are not um, you know they're not required to to buy um, product that has certain food safety certification at this time. Um, however, most of them do purchase from USDA vendors, uh, approved vendors all over the, the, the state and all over actually really the region. Um, and oftentimes those vendors do have food safety certification. Um, so uh, it's tip it, is a, it is a direction that uh, we're moving, but it currently is not a requirement of, requirement of schools. Um, and again, with liability, most producers carry some level of product liability. They do this because it um, well, mostly because in many instances they're required to, um, and their distributors will often demand it, and that really that can really vary. And again, it's really up to the district to decide, you know, what level of liability they would require a producer to carry for um, for selling a product to a school. Um, and as I mentioned, so market forces are driving food safety regulations. So if you um, if you aren't already aware, we are undergoing a major overhaul in our food safety. Um, system um, at the federal level, and so there will be in the future food safety requirements. Um, but again, they're not they're not on the school um, side at the at the current moment. Next slide. And and so basically, what that set of federal uh, regulations are are part of the Food Safety Modernization Act of 2011. And these, these rules have just recently been released. Um, the final rules have been released actually just this month by the FDA. And basically um, what, this, <clears throat> what they are designed to do is to help producers take steps to prevent food safety problems before they occur. Um, and this is, like I, like I just mentioned, this represents the first federal overhaul of our food safety system. Um, and it's going to have an impact on all producers to some extent in Oregon and, and, um, and beyond. And I just wanted to point out that there's a public meeting coming up um, in, in Portland on December 1st, and it's actually being convened by um, Idaho, Washington, and the Oregon Departments of Agriculture. And they're going to actually walk through these two different rules, the produce safety rule and the preventative 
con the pre preventive controls for human food um, rule as well. And so if people are interested, I would encourage you to attend that meeting um, because it's going to be, it's, it's going to, like I said, it's going to affect all of our producers. Um, and then oh, uh, Oregon State University also just um, applied for and received funding from the USDA to become a, a regional uh, training center for food safety. And so there's going to be quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of uh, technical assistance coming from our partners at OSU around, you know, bringing everybody into compliance with these new laws um, over the next several years. Okay, next slide. Okay, in addition to food safety, are there, you know, other legal requirements that schools and producers uh, need to be aware of? And, and yes, there are a few, and I, I think um, Rick mentioned these. So essentially, I just wanted to reiterate what what he said, and that you know, if you are purchasing um, dairy, eggs, meats, and poultry, they must be from a, a licensed facility and a USDA inspected facility, um, and that is a that is a requirement. Um, that they don't necessarily have to again have food safety certification, but they do have to be licensed, and they do have to have um, um, that the, the facility has to be licensed. So, um, and then in terms of fresh vegetables. Uh, fresh fruits and veggies. If you're set, if they're selling, if if growers are selling directly to schools, um, and they're and it's arriving to the school with no no processing or no no handling or packaging or um, any minimal processing, then they they can do so without any license or permit. Um, but if any of that is happening, um, they would need to have a food process. It would be have to be a licensed food processing facility. Next slide. Uh, a few tips about selling to schools, and Megan had, um, I believe she covered some of this, and, and uh, Rick as well, but, you know, just generally, schools have, have small food budgets. Um, they, they, they're very much limited in, in how much they can spend on school. They have about $1.50 to spend per child um, on food, and, and obviously they, they need to uh, be forward-thinking about their costs, such as, such as labor, um, that's that's a big one for schools, and they have to follow all federal and state procurement procurement rules, which does restrict them in some levels in terms of how much they can um, spend on food. And you know, in gen in general, they're off off oftentimes buying products at low prices. And you know, when I get calls from growers, they typically have um, a surplus of a crop, um, and they're trying to find a different markets to get it into. And that's usually that that actually works really well for some growers in, in selling that product to school when they've got a little bit of extra. Next slide. Um, in terms of how how easy it is for schools to handle a lot of product that arrives, um, you know, they often need it, obviously they need it delivered to them. Um, it's pretty difficult for schools, although we do hear of schools in smaller rural areas that, that will actually do some pickup. Um, but they do need, often need it delivered to them either on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Um, and, and it is a lot easier, as Megan was saying, um, to handle for schools, cuts down on their labor costs, et cetera, if it, if it is, you know, washed and, and sometimes either boxed or bagged so that it's, it's, it's more ready for them to use. Um, and I think it's important to keep in, in mind the realities a lot of these schools have in that they, you know, they don't necessarily have um, full kitchen um, infrastructure and facilities for a lot of that prep work um, and so sometimes they're just heat and serve kitchens or you know they really don't have the capacity to do a lot on site. Um, same with storage, we often hear that they don't have enough um, freezer storage or even you know any, any sort of obviously any sort of warehouse storage so that really limits how much volume they can handle at one time. Um, and so you know some of the things that we are looking at with growers who are wanting to sell more directly to schools is that, you know, in some instances it really makes more sense for them to sell um, to a distributor and get and, and then encourage that school to, to seek out and find their product through the distributor that they have contracts with. And that's, you know, that's sort of a promising strategy we have found in Farm to School is that um, working through a distributor is one way to kind of alleviate the um, challenges of these other ones above um, in terms of um, what schools have uh, capacity for. Next slide. So two, um, two things I just wanted to quickly go over and then um, I'll wrap it up. 
Um, but we, um, in the, the development and marketing division, we have just um, decided that we are going to be um, starting this farm to school promotion campaign in Oregon, and we're going to be doing that um, through different uh, publication and, and media. So we um, currently have a, the department puts out an agricultural quarterly, and we're going to be featuring uh, farm to school producers, ranchers, processors, etc in each of our quarterly um, papers over the next year or year and a half. So that's going to be um, just, you know, a wonderful opportunity to celebrate um, what the producer community is doing and how they're participating in Farm to School. Um, and then we're also going to be able to do a couple segments with K2 Northwest, which has about a 60-mile um, reach around the Portland metro area and do a few uh, two features on Farm to School producers over the next, um, the next year or so. Um, as well as Growing Oregon, which is our annual publication um, of, of agriculture in Oregon, so we'll have a, a nice spread in there. And then the other one that I wanted to mention is um, OSU and the Food Innovation Center and the Oregon Department of Agriculture are going to be hosting crop-up dinners um, around the state um, over the next year just to highlight Oregon specialty crops. And we're going to be doing um, a little, we're going to be doing awards for farm-to-school producers um, at those specialty crop dinners in, 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 those, um, in those areas, and I, I don't have the list of where they are, but they're going to be essentially all over the state. I think there's five or six planned, um, and so that's another way that we're going to sort of celebrate and promote um, farm-to-school producers. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention is that we're expanding our Food Corps program in Oregon. Um, we're taking applications for new service sites in 2016. Uh, and basically Food Corps, for those of you that don't know, is a national service program that's focused on childhood nutrition and healthy eating in schools. And we currently have, um, we currently have 10 service members in Oregon serving in eight counties. And, um, and they work a lot in our farm to school um, communities already and help promote school garden education. So if you know of an organization, um, for example, Megan's uh, Willamette Farm and Food Coalition, um, is currently hosting a service member, so if you, you know of other organizations sort of similar to hers that has relationships with schools and, and provide school garden education programming, we'd be um, interested in hearing from, from you or having you, you know, share this information with them. Great. And I think that's the end of my slides. Thank you so much, Amy. And so um, just in the interest of time, I know that it is 11.45 right now. So those of you who are on the call that need to leave, please feel free to do so. Um, I believe some of the presenters can stick around for another five minutes for a quick Q&A session. Um, Amy, I think I'm going to just start with you really quick since you are still on with me. Um, one person asked, she said she has um, a few local beef producers who would like to donate beef to the school, but they don't have a USDA inspected facility within a reasonable distance. Um, and they're wondering if a state inspected facility would work or not. And I, I think you've already answered that, but I just want to make sure Amanda gets her answer. That's a really that's a really timely question. I just talked to our um, animal health and food safety one of our inspectors last week about this question um, because we do have some of our processing facilities are um, are exempt from USDA inspection, and so that's that's exactly the question he and I were talking about. Um, but that was in regards to poultry, and so I'm not sure about beef. I I could ask him about that um, and get back to her. Who was the question from? Her, I, I'll, I'll make sure you get that information. Um, yeah, I would have to check. I would have to check on beef. I'm not sure about that. Okay, great. And then, um, Amy, this might be a question for you, but maybe for Rick. Um, let me pull it up. It's about chickens. We're interested in adding some chickens to our garden area in a coop, but then be able to use the eggs in the kitchen or sell at farmers market, and also use the manure as a fertilizer. Is this okay or not? I don't know if either one of you feels comfortable tackling that one. And Rick and Megan, I would encourage you to unmute yourselves now because you'll be getting questions. I, I, I can take that one. This is Rick. Can, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I can take that if, if uh, no one else wants it. Um, I, I do get calls from time to time about chickens and chicken coops. I know we have some in Oregon. As you can see by my profile picture, I'm into them. So, I mean, I, I use them as well. We have, a, we have resources, but keep in mind 
you know, like we said, produce is unregulated, other things, it can get tricky. Um, I think if it's an educational opportunity, you can certainly do whatever you wish in terms of teaching kids, but when you're trying to serve the food to the public, that's where it gets a little weird. I know there are certain regulations about serving food to the public in terms of like um, uh, amount, like you know, if you fall under a certain threshold, you might not need that inspection stuff. But I would um, err on the side of, uh, of uh, uh, caution and contact your local health department. You know, is one thing in terms of your if you're doing something in a local farmers market or whatever. I would just recommend from me from in the school setting that you know, protein items can go sideways really quickly. So I would just recommend that you do it as an educational thing and give the eggs away or whatever and try not to incorporate them into meals is that, you know, produce, it's a lot easier. Um, and and uh, so there, that's my recommendation for that for, for school gardens. The other thing about fertilizer and using that Officially, in our garden guide that we use, we say if you use commercial fertilizer, it's like kiln, kiln dried and stuff like that. I mean, I use fertilizer on my um, my beds at home, and I think it's perfectly safe, but that's my opinion in terms of when you're um, putting it in a school garden, you're talking about a highly susceptible age group that's um, susceptible to um, sickness and stuff and and chicken manure you know has E. coli and stuff like that in, in it so if you're using fresh stuff from your coop um, I would use it on beds that don't come in contact with food type plants but you know use it on use it on your roadies and things like that and your and your pollinators and things like that in a school setting, but I wouldn't want to go there. Even though I believe it's it's safe, you just don't want to go there in terms of liability. That's for where we've drawn the line. So those are my answers for those. Thanks, Rick. And one more for you: Is there a timeline to opt into the school garden farm to school grant you mentioned, or has that time passed? Yeah. Well, and I'm assuming you're talking about well the 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 two different sections of the grant the the non-competitive food grant yeah that ship has sailed for this school year now next school year it's going to be open again so there will be another opt-in period for school districts to opt in and um, those that were that for decided for whatever reason they didn't want to try it this year they have next school year to do that and that'll be in um, July but as far as the competitive grant yeah, there will be a full timeline on the website for that. Um, like I said, the, and we're anticipating the RFA will be uh, released Christmas break through February, mid-February, but there will be more concrete timelines and stuff when the RFA is released. Perfect. And I have one comment and one question left, and Megan, it's going to be for you. The comment is from one of our um, attendees from Idaho, and she just wanted to share that they are allowed to sell ungraded eggs, but the word ungraded has to be used and consumers notified, but she's not sure about um, if that's any different in Oregon. So thanks for sharing that. And then Megan, I think you're the best one for this, but um, Rick and Amy, or yeah, feel free to pop in if you have an answer. Um, how have schools tackled the challenge of shifting from commodity USDA food products that require um, no real cooking um, to freshly prepared from scratch meals? And she's noting that, you know, school cafeterias are often understaffed and underfunded and may not have um, proper cooking skills either. Yeah, I can answer that. The, um, a lot of the um, solution comes in thinking about getting products that are in a similar form to the way they would arrive if they came from a distributor already processed. So um, we can actually get locally grown carrots. Some, sometimes we can have them processed by a distributor or we can actually get um, soups made from a local processor. Um, or even or pizza, for example, that's already made, or bagels, hummus. So one thing that a lot of schools are doing is buying locally processed products, products that are either lo grown locally or um, grown elsewhere and processed in Oregon or in our communities. And sometimes those products can be more expensive um, than products we might be used to getting from our distributors, but 
um, the Oregon Department of Ed, Oregon Farm to School grants for purchases of Oregon grown and processed foods can help to address some of that and um, help provide some funding for that. Great. Well, thank you. Um, Megan, Rick, and Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to develop this webinar and for sharing a lot of rich information with us. And for those of you on the call, I hope that this was um, enjoyable and really informative. And I will be sending out a link to not only our quick survey, which is in the chat box, but all of the resources that have been mentioned today on the call. And um, I'll make sure that if you have questions that weren't answered, they're directed to the right person. Um, so thanks, everyone. This is recorded and should be available on our website within the next week. So thank you and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.